this evening's um, seminar is with uh, Dr. Shelton Good um, to discuss the 2016 presidential election myths and facts and the impact on um, diversity in terms of culture, companies, and communities. Um, so to introduce Dr. Young, Dr. Young is a Duke University continuing education professor, consultant, retired corporate executive, thought leader, Air Force veteran, author, and speaker. In addition to teaching at several colleges and universities, he has held executive roles with MARTA, Georgia Power, and Southern Company. He is a decorated Air Force veteran and dedicated community leader who has served unselfishly when his leadership was needed most. He was appointed to the Georgia Bar Investigative Panel by the Georgia Supreme Court and advised and served for three years. He chaired the Troy University DPA Advisory Board for five years. Currently, Dr. Good serves as the Chief Diversity Officer for the National Association of African Americans and Human Resources. He also serves on the Georgia Diversity Council Board of Directors. Dr. Good is a passionate educator who has used his knowledge to mentor and teach students for almost two decades, including me as a mentee. <laughs> He, um, he was awarded the first ever African American Dictorial uh, Fellowship at Troy University and was later selected Faculty Member of the Year by the school. Um, he is nationally recognized as a thought leader who authored several books including So You Think You Can Teach, A Guide for the New College Professor on How to Teach Adult Learners, Diversity Managers, Angels of Mercy or Barbarians at the Gate, which is very interesting. Um, as well as Crisis as a Platform for Social Change from Strawberry Mansion to Silicon Valley, and his latest book, Winter in America, the Impact of the 2016 Presidential Election on Diversity in Companies, um, Communities, and the Country. Dr. Good was named one of the top diversity leaders to follow on Twitter, for all you millennials, um, by Reigns International in 2018. He, has been recognized several times as a who's who in Atlanta. In 2016, he was named one of the most influential African Americans in Wisconsin by Madison 365 Magazine. He is the first person to be awarded the Roosevelt Thomas Lifetime Achievement Award by the Technology Association of Georgia. He is the only person awarded HR Trailblazer Award three times by the National Association of African Americans in Human Resources. Let us give a round of applause to Dr. Shelton. Okay, good evening. Um, in, um, in addition to that uh, generous uh, introduction that uh, Dr. Greer um, gave, uh, let me just add a couple of things to my bio um, just to give tonight's uh, lecture some, some context. Uh, although I have spent uh, a considerable uh, amount of my career in the uh, corporate and higher ed sector um, as a human resource executive or a human resource professor uh, specializing in uh, diversity and inclusion, I actually uh, went to the University of Alabama, Roll Tide, um, to, and got a degree in uh, public administration. Uh, and I say that because I'm a public policy guy. Um, prior to uh, prior to joining the, the corporate sector, I spent over two decades um, in the United States Air Force. And one of my, uh, no, actually in two, two of my assignments, I was the uh, attache to the ambassador for Saudi Arabia. And I was also the chief of staff to the ambassador of Egypt. So I'm a public policy guy. Um, tonight's lecture, which is gonna be extremely fast, so please do not blink, do not yawn, because she didn't give me half the, uh, the time that I really need to, to, to get into this. Um, so um, tonight's uh, lecture is going to be uh, about, not so much about uh, diversity and inclusion, as much as, it, as much as it's going to talk about the, uh, the presidential election and the, the impact of that election. And I think that the timing is exquisite. 
although it may initially feel like a back to the future, um, you know, turn back the clock, I think since we are, or we are on the eve of another um, presidential campaign, it is very important to make sure that we differentiate the facts of what happened in 2016 uh, from the myths. Secondly, we need to better understand the public policy implications because while everyone has gotten caught up in the tweets and the rhetoric and what has come on MSNBC or CNN or whatever news show you watch, I think we have um, gotten distracted from the implications of what has been a um, bad public policy at the federal level and then the absence of, 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 of public policy at the federal level. And the implications of that, especially, especially on the, on the uh, uh, national security and the international affairs um, front, I think has um, been largely ignored by people who have been absolutely uh, caught up in the, the, the daily round by round um, fighting that has been um, dominated by uh, an investigation. We are coming up on a, another election. And if we do not at least, and again, I'm not here to tell you which way to vote. I'm not here today representing the left or the right, Democrat, Republican, or, or otherwise. I'm here to talk about the facts because if the facts go unacknowledged, and more importantly, uh, un unappreciated, um, there is a greater, a greater than 60% uh, chance that we will see a complete repeat of what we saw on uh, November the 8th of 2016. So with that as a context, let's go ahead and jump into it. I will leave the maximum amount of time I can for questions and answers, but let me tell you right now, there's too much information and not enough time. So all of you guys already have your phones and computers out. Uh, go to Twitter, go to LinkedIn, um, find me, connect with me, and I would encourage you to uh, let's continue this conversation um, uh, on, uh, on, on social media. Okay? All right, so let's go ahead and get, go ahead and get started. Talked about myself, set some context. Let's talk about something that wasn't supposed to happen. Um, regardless of which side you were on, we, um, we witnessed in uh, November of 2016 the, the, uh, the biggest upset in presidential election history. On a country, and a, for a country who has always prided itself on telling everyone that the most qualified person is supposed to get the job. Uh, all you have to do is uh, work hard, pay your dues, and uh, things will happen. What we saw was a complete antithesis uh, uh, to that. Um, Again, let's just quickly make sure we understand what actually happened. I uh, don't know if uh, you've actually um, tracked or paid close attention to what was happening to the election, but again, if you did not, let me, let me uh, throw out a couple of things that you may were not aware of, um, you know, what seems like a millennium ago. The, the, what happened was not supposed to happen, not based on all of the polling data, not based on electoral uh, history, and not based on um, everything that we know. In fact, um, just uh, almost uh, 30 to 45 days out from the election, um, Hillary Clinton had a very, very comfortable lead um, and had had that lead and was projected to win going all the way back almost 18 months prior to the election. Uh, in presidential election uh, history, um, no one has saw a trend line like this end up in a result where the person who was out in front um, that uh, heading for that long and heading up to the election actually turn around and lose the election. And so um, what happened? A number, a number of things happened. Um, number one, um, a lot of people will say on the right that the left should have seen this coming given the very, very, very um, strong race that um, Bernie Sanders ran against um, Hillary Clinton. Um, while I was one that was, that thought that 
she had to burn up a lot of um, a lot of money to defend herself and, and uh, against Bernie and actually win the nomination. I, I did not think that that would in fact create a headwind that would result in uh, the result that we that we saw. So the results: who 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 won? Who 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 lost? <laughs> go, go ahead, say it louder. That's what that's the that's the number one answer everyone gives. I, I would I would say the I would say that the country the country lost. Um, obviously, Donald Trump wins the presidency with 306 electoral votes. Um, Hillary Clinton um, um, obviously won the um, popular vote uh, um, by more than almost um, three. Um, three million, and of course you say, so what? And I'll, you'll be hearing me say this a lot. So what, Dr. Good? Now you hear people again. What is weirdest? What has come up again? And it comes up every so often is whether or not the electoral college is uh, still relevant and still the way to um, elect um, the uh, the president. Whether or not we will see any change from it or not, I do not know. But again, um, this result. Um, in the way that it happened has generated that conversation again. Um, <clears throat> everybody focused on, everybody focused on a presidential race. Um, unless you are uh, a, a geek like myself that, 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 that goes to bed every night, um, you know, after watching uh, MSNBC and, and all of the, the, the pundits on the television, you may have missed the fact that the Republicans retained uh, a majority in the Senate. Obviously, and again, I'm gonna give you the punchline to all of this, because this is not a class. Um, obviously, with them retaining um, the, the Senate, we you saw what happened in terms of the um, the selection of Supreme Court justices, will, which will have implications for years to come. Um, in, in addition to retaining the, the Senate, they also uh, retain, um, they also retain um, the House, and again, Public policy, for um, by and large, um, comes from uh, from these two bodies. And if not, if it wasn't for the fact that uh, the the White House got distracted by um, its harsh immigration policies, who knows what could have happened in the um, immediately following um, the uh, the election and with the Republicans retaining the House and the Senate. Um, I think we may have. Um, caught a slight break, which we saw then um, uh, get a, a little bit more of a break with the um, with the House results in 2018. Um, so let's separate some election, some uh, some myths from some facts. Um, there are a lot of people that have their own opinion about what happened. And what I say as a, as a political scientist is everybody is entitled to their own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own, your own facts. And regardless of um, how you may feel about what happened, the facts are the facts. Fact number one, and I'm not ranking these, um, I'm just gonna go down the ones that resonate with me the most. The thing that I completely did not see coming, and, the, I, and I would dare to say, Neither did, neither did uh, uh, Hillary Clinton's team, um, was the fact that she would not hold on to the Obama coalition. Um, I think that was taken uh, for granted and, and um, they did so at their own peril. So much so that states, including Pennsylvania, my own uh, hometown, uh, were, were states that Obama had won but Trump flipped. You cannot win without winning Pennsylvania uh, in Ohio. I was in Wisconsin at the time. On November the 9th, 2016, I was in Appleton, Wisconsin. And two weeks before that, I took a, a drive 20 miles north of Appleton and 20 miles south, and I did not see one Hillary Clinton sign or one Hillary Clinton uh, uh, anything. And then, it was only then that I began to get, uh, I started putting together um, some facts, which obviously we know what, uh, what happened. Um, there was a profound split between, the urban, between urban and rural voters. I don't know if you've seen this map, but if you, you look at this map and you say, wow, we are um, a red 
um, a red uh, country? How was it that um, Barack won in 08, and how he won, how, how did he again win in 12? Um, and again, we're not going to go that far, that far back. But I will tell you, give you the headline to this whole lecture, is that if, if, so I might as well just go to the next slide. If the traditional groups, and I'm going to go specifically about African Americans, had turned out in the exact proportions that they did in, in 12, I'm not even going to go back to eight. In fact, if they had turned out in the proportions that they turned out in four, you would have had a different, um, you would have had a different um, outcome. Um, the, I, this is a classic example of taking too many things for, uh, for granted, and you can see that uh, in the case of African Americans, Hillary underperformed a Barack by, and these percentage point percentage points may look little to you, but these are huge. These are these are these are huge. Um, Trump voters, even when asked, you know, does he care about make it's going to bring about change, right experience, good judgment. Even those folks that thought that Hillary had the better judgment and experience still went with um, Trump um, because they they want they wanted change. And that change was fueled by uh, a lot of uh, different reasons. Um, those, and, and that's despite the fact that the voters who voted for um, Trump uh, generally um, had uh, relatively low uh, uh, opinions of him in a number of different ways that you see uh, there on the on the slide. So, what really happened, Dr. Good? Um, the polls weren't accurate. We know that. Of course, we're looking backwards now. The polls weren't accurate. They didn't accurately gauge the intensity and the excitement of lower educated voters in the, the Make America Great contingent. Clinton was um, supremely confident, and this led to, uh, be, uh, she was very confident um, because of the fact she had an extensive uh, ground game, huge advantage in fundraising, uh, uh, assumed uh, a, a strong minority uh, voter turnout and thought that the big blue wall um, would hold and of course we saw Pennsylvania get flipped and so this 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 the polls completely missed the intensity and the depth of the voter anger you had some other things that was going on at the same time you had wage um, stagnation fueling that um, anger um, you, had, you got 76 percent of, of Americans at that point, living paycheck to paycheck. Um, insurance rates rose. Huge um, energy around uh, immigration um, and racial tensions. Um, student debt led to some lethargy. The, the, the same sort of millennials that turned out in eight and 12 um, stayed home um, in, in a big way in 16. And then you had a lot of folks in the middle class, um, almost 33% that were middle class in the 70s completely um, um, dropped out. So time will, is, is not going to allow me to go through the total complete um, fallout, but I will, I would like to at least just touch on a couple. Is that because Trump ran on a lot of um, what I would call unelectable promises. Um, promises to uh, get rid of NATO, to, to um, not um, to uh, immigration, to not um, to get out of a lot of trade uh, agreements, um, he ran on the fact that he was going to um, do a lot of things that he's in fact doing, which is, uh, of course, taking a hard stand against China. Just within the last 72 hours, a major announcement about uh, sanctions on 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 Iran. Um, again, lots and lots of ca um, campaign promises. And under a, a normal circumstances, um, such as the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, as unpopular as it was, would have still been unelectable campaign um, campaign promises. Let's just scoot ahead a little bit. Um, the big ones for me personally are in the area of um, domestic policy, and especially in the financial services. These would be public policies that, unless 
you have a, uh, a huge stake, um, investment, st um, investment stake, um, or uh, you are doing things where you are constantly um, involved in financial matters. There's been a slew of um, regulations um, passed, a lot of them through executive order, um, basically um, undermining, not, I won't say undermining, let's say undoing a lot of the things that were put in place by the, uh, by the Obama administration. Um, obviously, a lot of people know about the, 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 the tax reform, but um, if, if you were like me, you got a shock when you filed your taxes this year. Uh, for the first time in several years, I had to pay. Um, I'm sure I'm not, a, I'm not alone. Um, and of course, that, ta that tax bill was funded in large part by the repatriation of foreign earnings from U.S. Uh, corporations, proving again that there's just no free um, lunch. Um, the, uh, the corporate rates are lowest as they've ever been, but you're going to find that those rates are going, that loss of revenue is going to be, um, is going to be made up by the elimination of a slew, and I do mean this, a slew of tax um, changes that um, I'm sure some of you found, found out when you went to file your, your income tax. Um, the one that, Trump, that that scares me the most, and I'll end here and take questions, is around is the this whole um, attempt to put what I believe will be the most unqualified individuals on the Fed board um, in the last two decades. Um, obviously, Herman Cain um, pulled out, thank goodness, but um, that I don't think that's going to give us a reprieve. You say, well, Dr. Good, what's the Fed board have to do with me? Um, it has everything to do um, with you. And so, again, as we find ourselves on the, let me just speed up a little bit. Yeah, you do this. And I'll, I'll, end, I'll end, um, end here. Um, we've got an election coming up. So where, where, where do we go from here? I'm not a mind reader. Um, and I'm not going to make any predictions, but the things that I'm paying the most, I'm paying more attention to uh, today is <clears throat> whether or not the major networks are going to double down and, and do um, more research, more investigation, and more homework. Or are they going to simply try to set up this next presidential election like they have all of the ones previously as it was a prize fight in an interest to get ratings, or whether or not they're going to truly um, look into the uh, look after the public interest and do their homework, and let's see if we can get a little bit more accurate information in regards to what's happening, especially since we have a record number of people on the Democratic side uh, entering the uh, the Democratic primary. The the media again, they're they're there to make money, so they want um, ratings. Um, what I hope that they will do again is uh, obviously they want their they want their they want their ratings they want the they would like to see a, a good fight but what I'm hoping is that that they will put that aside or at least balance it out in the interest of um, public interest um, obviously the, the the CNNs and the MSNBCs they want the politicians to be controversial uh, it's easier and cheaper to just let the the two sides compete, and of course, the conflict results in um, results in breaking news. A couple of things I just want you to, to think about, and then I will get in here. There's going to all there's a lot of breaking news in the Trump in the Trump administration. That's going to happen all the way up until um, until uh, November the 8th of 2020. We've seen it before. It was there in the 2016 campaign, right up until the election, and then you had uh, you had protests on November the 9th. Um, we've seen headlines like Donald Trump finally went too far. I don't believe there's a such thing. So there's going to be lots and lots of stories, um, but with a very uh, little impact. That's been the story so far. I don't believe anything that is going to happen uh, in the next 18 months is going to change, but it just, I think what you're going to find is we're going to have a Christopher Columbus moment and we're going to discover really what this country is about. And we're going to find out whether rules, whether institutions, and whether character um, really uh, makes a difference. 
Again, not here to tell you who to vote for, um, but I am telling you if, you, if you care about the country, if you care about your family, if you care about your future, vote, get others out to vote, and, and vote whichever way you think is in your best interest and in the best interest of the country. With that, I'll take any questions that you have. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, had a map up of voting patterns in 2016, and I noticed around the um, like the, the borders or the coastline mm -hmm. of the United States is exactly two different voting patterns mm -hmm. in the middle. Mm -hmm. Could you possibly explain reasonings to Easy. that? Yes. And then um, the second one that I have, um, Um, given what we know about Clinton um, not winning the states that you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. with Biden kind of, um, I guess, like banking on her same kind of constituents, how do you think that Biden is going to fare out moving forward um, as a Democratic uh, candidate for president? Okay. Um, good questions. Thank you. Uh, very, very thoughtful. Um, I was warned that you guys ask tough questions. All right. So let me see. let me take the first one. You asked me about the you asked me about the voting patterns. Yes. You notice that they're rural around bodies of, of water, mm -hmm. lakes, rivers, um, oceans, etc. That's no secret. Um, farming, farming. So what you still have even to this day is obviously um, in your rural uh, uh, agricultural areas um, people uh, that can trace their, you know, basically subsistence and their background back to, back to farming. No, no secret there. The, 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 the question is, why would they vote, why do they tend to vote more conservative than, than, than whatever? And, and again, time won't allow to get in, into, into that, um, but if I can do a shameless plug, I do talk about it a little bit in the book. <laughs> just a shameless, just, you know, just a little shameless plug. It, it, I do talk about that just a little bit, um, in the book, but I, I will tell you, I, for me, um, I, I, when I wrote the book for an example, I started it on November 9, 2016. I just couldn't believe this was going to happen. But what I did was I, I went out and I talked to people. I talked to people that voted the way that they voted, and I wanted to know why. And that's what I talk about in the book. And I will tell you, I, uh, one of the chapters is, voters in red states are not barbarians at the gate. They care about sending their kids to good school. They care about uh, lower taxes. They care about security. They care about defense. Um, they care about a lot of the same things that, that a lot of us care about. So why do they tend to vote one way or another? I can't, time won't allow that. But why you see them in the rural areas? Um, because, of, because of farming. Your second question, um, I, Biden is not going to go after the, the Clinton coalition. Okay, um, and so he, if you're asking me, this is just Dr. Shelton Good, and I'm already journaling and, and, and writing down what I think. He's gonna find himself in almost a uh, uh, similar, but not identical situation as Gore 2000. Do you, do, you, do you run away from Clinton and try to stake your own ground as your own man after being someone's vice president for eight years? Um, or do you try to embrace it and of course, Clinton was a little bit more toxic. So, so the, does he tr uh, try to capture a, an Obama coalition, which by the way, was in 08 and 12, was a coalition that no one had saw in, um, cobbled together. Um, for, I had two sons. Both of my sons voted for the first time in 08 and 12. And it wasn't even any, they, they, it wasn't even a thought of who they were going to um, vote for. There wasn't even a conversation about it. Um, so there's some uniqueness there. I think that, I think that Biden has a, a number of things to, that he has to be concerned about. First of all, he's got to get through a tough primary. And there's not enough differentiation between him and a lot of candidates, not on policy. So Biden's got to tell the story. But a, but a big part of that story, part of it is, is questionable. I mean, he gave Anita Bill the business um, back in the day. Um, but and then, and then his other, you know, he's ran for president three times. He spent eight years as a vice president. Uh, working for, you know, whatever I still will believe history will show 
was um, probably one of the, the, the better presidents, especially considering the context in which he had to serve. So he's got a tough ground to carve out. He first has to get through a tough, and I do mean a tough primary. He has, he's, he's got to worry about age. Um, he's got to worry about a lot of perception. So before he even gets to a national, um, I don't, but I do not believe that he is going to go after, nor should he try to go after a coalition that Hillary thought was hers, but was never really hers. Was never really hers. For an example, she thought she had white women on lock. She did not. College educated white women, but not white women that had 12 years or less education. She thought she had all of them on lock. She did not. So if I was him, and that's why you saw him enter the race late, I believe he has some of the best minds doing some of the best research. And I think they, they basically told him he could win the primary and, um, and it stood better than a 50-50 chance of winning, um, depending on how the economy goes against Trump. So we'll see. We'll see. Good question. Thank you. Other questions? How's my time? By the way? OK. Yes, sir. Uh, I see that under the Obama administration, we how can you get other businesses, you know, when they get those uh, tax increases to uh, actually employ more people or uh, increase their uh, Okay, their perfect question, because I'm a business owner too. Um, I'm actually the president and CEO of Icarus Consulting. I mean, that's what I do. Um, so I, I appreciate that question more than you know, because it lets me talk about the two things I care about the, the most, um, which is economics in terms of its impact on public policy. And, and then the, I, have to, I have to actually go around the country talking to cl clients like Papa John's, um, Starbucks, Ancestry.com, and about two dozen other clients that I have about the same question. So first, can I correct a couple facts though? Yes. So under the, Obama, under the Obama administration, let's make sure we understand what, let's make sure we understand what happened, okay? Um, it, while it may not have been popular, there were some things that had to happen, and it was basically uh, choosing between a rock and a hard place. So we know the only winners that came out of the uh, out of the recession, the Great Recession, were the banks. All the big banks got bigger, okay. And then the only thing that he could do, uh, that I think, that I personally, this is just me personally believe, um, what I personally believe, you can't, you can't, you have to pick your fights. The day he, he won, McConnell said, I'm gonna make sure you're a one-term president. He had, this, he, had, he had an economy he had to deal with, and he wanted to get something done, which was health care. There was a lot of trade-offs done, and he was on a clock, because the Tea Party, McConnell, immediately went into full-fledged. He knew he only had two years, and was un under threat to lose the house. So it's like, let me try to get something done. So this is, it, this is what he said, um, let me get, Healthcare done, and then I'm gonna try to pass as many banking regulations as I can to at least make the banks not so that that situation doesn't happen again. Okay, first term. Second term, what happens? Things started turning. Things started turning around. But just like every, anybody in here that knows about uh, 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 elasticity and differential curves, you're not going to see the actual results if they're lagging indicators. So now you saw. Um, in, seven, in, 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 seven, in 17, in particular, uh, 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 the results of a lot of things that have been put in place in 16. Trust me, my returns on my 401k went through the roof. Obviously, you have a, a person in the office, again, I'm not right or left, I'm just here to tell the truth. And I don't know if anyone in here hunts or plays golf, but hunters have this saying that says, I'm gonna shoot at everything that flies, I'm going to claim everything that falls. And that's basically what you have with the Trump administration, taking credit for things that actually happened in 16. So let's make sure we got the facts straight. Now, what, you, what happened was the tax break. That's his. But let's be very clear. There is no free lunch. Corporate rates went down. Uh, everybody's rates went down. 
But let me tell you, anybody here from the East Coast, from New York, where you from? Oh, anybody in here from the East Coast? Nobody. Okay, so you don't know about three card Molly. Okay, all right, forget it. Um, any, anyway, there's nothing free. The, if, if you, when you went to file your income tax returns, I don't know if you itemized, but there were a lot of things that you could itemize just last year that you could not itemize this year. That's how you, get, that's how you got a tax break. Um, corporate, er, um, corporate rates went, went down because obviously they were allowed to repatriate um, 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 earnings from overseas. So it's just money being shifted from one pot to another, or basically, actually, it's almost like somebody says, come buy some furniture, and you don't have to pay interest for a year. You pay the interest, it just gets paid, it just gets paid later. You say, what's that got to do with companies? What does that have to do with companies? Companies that are owned publicly have one or two choices. They can either return the money to shareholders who invest in them, or they can take the money and invest it in um, things that's gonna make the company better. You, in order to make the company better, you can invest in people or you can invest in automation. What do you think I'm going to do? Let me tell you what happened real quick. A lot of people who were uh, uh, underemployed from 10 to 14 came back into the job market in the vengeance attempting to make up for the fact that they took a job previously that was two levels low. Retention bonuses, hiring bonuses, relocation costs shot through the roof. What do you think I'm going to do if I'm a CEO of a company and I'm a, and, or my shareholders are breathing down my neck? I'm going to try to get an app and I'm going to invest in AI, machine learning, um, the internet of things, and I'm going to automate because I can't afford to pay the people that stay with me, especially if they're under collective bargaining agreement, and I certainly can't pay the people that's coming back because now they're mad because they got to make up for all the money they lost. And then the new kids coming in, no disrespect, want to be vice president tomorrow and because they saw what happened to their parents and their, their salary expectations are out of line with what companies want to pay. Notice I said it's not out of line with what they should get, but they're out of line with what companies want to pay. And then guess what? And then you have a person in the White House that changed immigration policy, so now you can't hire overseas talent. So now all of my costs are higher. No, I'm not going to give the money to people that's going to work for me for two years, get me, train them, and go someplace else. I'm going to find an app and see if I can't reduce headcount. And I talk to CEOs every day, and that's what they tell me. I'm looking for ways to increase profits and not add headcount. And if I got to invest in uh, artificial intelligence, and spend that money, um, my, my shareholders would, uh, would applaud me for that. So I don't have, I've got nothing but bad news. Wage growth is not going to keep pace with expectations, nor is it going to keep pace with inflation. That's why you're going to have people, and everybody in Atlanta already knows this, that's why everybody in Atlanta already has a side hustle, because it takes a job and a half or two jobs to earn the money that you want to earn. I don't know how anyone who doesn't earn a living wage makes it in um, now, because you've got people and, um, that are earning a living wage, but still not what they need. Um, and, and kids coming out of school um, with student debt, I don't know. But I don't, that I can tell you, nothing but bad news, and it's coming directly from the CEO of Cushman Wakefield, the CEO of, um, uh, I can name, uh, uh, AE, uh, American Electric Power, um, Starbucks, I was just in California two weeks ago um, talking to their senior leadership team. No, they're not looking to invest in people. They're looking to invest in technology. Sorry. No good news there. Um, how much time? Okay, yes sir. Um, well, thank you for the presentation. My question is more at the macro than the micro level of the individuals. Uh, the general perception among the elite and active mission in this country is that Trump is not the causation, he's a symptom. And he's more of a correlation than causation. And uh, the general, again, the perception is that what we see today in the political environment is a cause of a neoliberal economic policy implemented in this country in the last 30 or 40 years. Okay. So my question is, what do you think about this concept? And the follow-up question is, can this neoliberal economic policy can be reversed? Um, 
That's a loaded question. Um, can, can I ask you one question for clarification? When you say liberal economic policy, can you be more specific? Are you we talking need a about liberal economic policy? You need a liberalism. Okay. We are, we are talking about Reaganomics, for example. Okay. Where the entire economic policy was totally deregulated. The commerce, banking, the entire situation was uh, was, was absolutely deregulated. The market was deregulated. Okay. All right. Man. I know it's going to get quick, that, that tough a question. Um, because, again, I started, when I went to the University of Alabama, I initially thought I was going to get a PhD in economics. So I tend to look at tax policies and those things in terms of uh, in, in desired outcomes and actual outcomes, not communicated or espoused uh, outcomes. Um, I'm not certain I can answer your second question about the liberalism, um, but I would, the first half of your question, um, I, I would like to take a, take a, a slight swing at. You said you don't want to talk about the, the, the micro of the, of the individuals, fine. So let's talk about the country. Um, what, what, what I have seen and what I see today is a continuation of, of, a, of a country that ha is still continuing to fight for its, 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 its soul. Whether or not this, in fact, is going to be uh, a country where everyone has equal opportunity, whether it's justice for all, or whether or not it's going to be um, the country is going to continue to be a country that benefits a few uh, on the backs and at the expense of, uh, of, of everyone else. All, all I know is that um, every day I'm sitting with CEOs of companies that are struggling with the fact that they are that they are good companies trying to have good trying to have uh, 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 trying to make money for their shareholders trying to have uh, trying to have a good workplace for their employees but yet they are having to manage an environment where um, we use these words diversity inclusion equity and quality let's just forget about the terms for a second but the work that I do there's two ways that people look at it. Number one, they look at the work that I do, they believe that it's work that's going to benefit uh, females and people of color at the expense of white men. White, um, and then um, the other side of it is that the work that I do is supposed to, supposed to level a playing field um, because of the, um, past um, treatment um, in, in equity. And in fact, in the matter, the work that I do is not about either one. Companies employ people, and once a person steps into a company, there is a legal thing that happens, which attorneys call an exchange of considerations. Once those ex um, considerations are exchanged, I agree to come work for you and give you my time, my resources, my energy, my intellectual capacity. You agree to give me, um, you, you, you agree to give me uh, salary compensation, uh, other benefits. And so therefore, um, when a person is at a company, they can leave a company for a good reason, a bad reason, or no reason at all. And like on the same token, a company can ask someone to leave for a good reason, a bad reason, or no reason at all. They just can't ask them to leave for a reason that is ill, that is illegal. So every day, the one place where people should just simply be coming to work doing their work, do, um, producing what they are being paid to do, and at the same time, being treated with value because they bring value to the company, respect because they're a human being, and then being productive. Neither one are happy. So in the economics terms, in economics terms, there is what my, what I find myself talking to uh, a lot of companies about is this dead weight loss. This dead weight loss, this lack of, I believe GDP could be higher, but right now we are so absolutely, positively consumed with things that we uh, ingest from television, 99.9% um, .9 of which you have no direct control over. And so what it, what it results in um, is, the, is some of the biggest drag on productivity that I think we've seen in um, the last eight to 12 years. So I can't answer the second this the second part of uh, of uh, of your your question, um, but I sure would like to 
um, meet and, and talk with you, I, I suspect I could probably learn a couple things uh, from you. All I know is that I'm concerned that we, this should be, we should be flying high right now. GDP um, and some other things, but we've got these major headwinds, and I believe it's a result of um, the distractions and the lack of leadership that's coming from 1600 Pennsylvania. Yes, ma'am. Um, I think you got 20 candidates on the Democrat side. I think, I think 50-50. I think, I think 50-50. Who will have harm their process? Um, in a general election or a Democratic primary? Because like, you have to look at them separate. You have to look at them separate. You got, you got to get through the primary first. <laughs> you got to get through the primary first. I, 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 I know we want to jump ahead to the, to the race at the end. But somebody's got to, you got to get through, and we saw, all you do is go back to 16 and saw what happened on the Republican side. He didn't try to run a general election. And, and he, he said, let me just, let me just by any means necessary get through the, 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 the primary and then we'll see what happens. You know, people will speculate he never thought he was going to win anyway. I, I, I happen to, to bind to that speculation. But, but to go back to your question, you got to get through the primary first. And, and so, and so, who, somebody's, people are going to take, somebody's going to try to do, have, them, have it both ways. Some people are going to take one path. Some people are going to take the others. And then we're going to see what happens. Um, but I tell you what, I believe, you ask me what I think is going to happen. The person that does, that doubles down on their analytical research and really finds out what the pulse of people are right now, not just where the energy are, but is that energy going to be translated into a primary vote? Um, the person, the, whoever does that the best is going to make it through the primary. Once you get through the general election, it is going to be, you, you, you're not, no matter who emerges on the Democratic side, you're going to have a contrast. And the country is going to again be given a chance to say, do you want to vote for someone that I think is not qualified um, and has, has, has questionable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, or do you want to vote for the other person? And um, and, and people are going to make a choice. They, they made a choice before, but again, I hope you heard me when I started out my lecture. The biggest choice, when I say who won and who lost, the biggest choice was made by the people who decided not to even vote. The people who made the biggest choice, who had a chance to elect the first ever woman for president, chose to stay home. These were people that voted in 12 that didn't vote in 16, I mean, that voted in 2004 that chose to stay home. That didn't make any sense to me. That doesn't make any sense. So they're gonna to have to continue to study that and learn from it. And me, if I was on a campaign, run one race at a time. Run one race at a time. Figure out what you need to do to win a primary, win the primary, and then run a general election. Well, like, will the Republican Party charge you to stand for like the whole Trump notion? No. Yeah. Debate, well, no, well, they don't have to. All, all, well, let me tell you what will happen. Is a repeat of uh, what we've seen. Is you will see a base of 37% vote for the, 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 the current president no matter what. And then the rest of the people are going to stand on the sidelines and see what happens. Now, what for me, if I could, if I could predict what's going to happen, I would go buy a lottery ticket. What's, what I'm interested to see is who emerges from the Democratic primary and will and will middle of the road and independence go for that Democratic candidate. And um, that's, what's gonna, that's, that's what's gonna happen. I don't think you're gonna see a repeat of 12 and eight and 12, but you don't even need that. You just need a little shift. And I do mean a little, a little shift. You saw the five states that flipped. Five states that every, every, I mean, every Democratic candidate going back you know, to the beginning of time won, flipped. Um, all you need is those to go back. Yeah. He, they could all, he could almost lose, the Democratic can candidate could almost lose Ohio and Florida and still win. But people have to vote. If they stay home in record numbers like they did in 16, you're going to have a repeat of 16. I think I got time for one more. No, I got plenty of time? Yeah. I thought I wanted a little bit of time. Okay. All right, I want to hold nobody up. Yes, ma'am. 
I'm Elaine Colley, undergraduate political science major. So there's a myth that had Sanders not run for president, Hillary Clinton would have had a chance, would have had a chance of winning. What is your stance on that? Nope. Take Sanders, and, and I can say this because, where's my PhD students? Okay, you, what, you, you guys uh, do research design yet? Statistics, stats? Okay, not yet. All right. Well, okay. You will. You will. Um, so I ran a stepwise. I ran. So this book, while it was motivated by my disappointment of the results, I wanted facts. And so as a scientist, I did what any scientist would do. You get data. You put it into it, you build the model, you, you test the model, you run, you run a stepwise multiple regression to be able to identify the level of variation, uh, to explain the levels of, of variation. And so you take Sanders out of the equation um, and, you, and everything else happened, the Comey last minute um, bombshell about, the, uh, about the, the newfound computer and maybe there's emails on it as well as some other uh, um, things and the anger and everything else is still there, you will get the same result. You will get the same result. It is clear, now we can look back. It's easy to look back with data and look back. Um, they, we clearly just misunderstood and didn't capture the, the intensity um, of, the, of the uneducated, um, I mean, when I say uneducated, we're talking about um, whites in particular with, uh, without a college degree, particularly white women. And then, of course, no one could predict that um, African Americans and Latinos would stay home in the numbers that they did. But no, you um, you take Sanders out. Uh, Hillary Clinton would have ended up with more money for the general campaign, but she still would have lost. She still would have lost. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for coming and joining us today. My name is Kurt Young. I'm chair of the Department of Political Science, and uh -oh. I should have been here to. <laughs> So He's here to fact check me. <laughs> I just want to apologize for not being here no, no, no. To, to see you when you arrive. But I do want to I do want to push you a little bit on a premise of the presentation, uh, notwithstanding the fact that I missed a few minutes, right? Okay. Uh, so there is an assumption that, and I think I heard you say it, uh, that this should not have happened. Uh, perhaps that what occurred, no one saw this coming, and that, in a sense, uh, 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 we can look to Clinton and other factors, some of which you've mentioned, to explain this anomaly, right? So imagine, if you will, 100% total voter participation, where everyone who could vote, voted. Right. The hypothetical question is, would we have had a total different outcome. Now, that's just a hypothetical. Let me paint it against this backdrop. Okay. In 1967, King right. made what I thought was his most inspirational speech right. at Riverside Church, where he talked about the three evils right. of American society, right? Right. right? Militarism, and not in this order, militarism, racism, and poverty. Right. 1967, right? Right. If we project forward, perhaps, what we are seeing now is a fulfillment, or at least a new manifestation of what King was articulating. We're okay. seeing a class dynamic where the okay. impoverishment is, is existing right alongside okay. this massive uh, income gap, right? Okay. We are seeing what King called racism is actually a, a kind of ethnocentrism that's, that is embodied in what Trump has been articulating. Okay. And we're seeing, some would argue, um, that the the key to American, the current American, America's current international posture is its military empire, right? Right. I can't disagree with yeah, that. Yeah, so, so I'm not sure I agree with this, but I want to push the point. Good. To suggest that perhaps the anomaly had been what the, the gap in time that led up to Obama. Okay, agree. And then what we're seeing now may be the reality rather than the nightmare. This may be the reality that goes back to the question that perhaps if you had 100% voter participation in America, perhaps you may have this exact same outcome. Um, so that's, that's just what I'm going to I, 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 I so miss doing this. Uh, I would, I, you almost made me want to come back and do this full time. Because uh, you, don't, you don't have the debates outside. I would agree with you, but I'm going to... I, 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 
I, it, it's counterintuitive. Right. I want to agree with you. Right. Um, I suspect we may be close in age or whatever. So I agree with you. Right. Um, I've heard these debates. My, my uncle is the former mayor of Philadelphia. Um, my cousin is the president of the city council. This is all we talked about. Namesake, right? Yeah, yeah. this is all we talked about. This is all I know. Right. Uh, my mother was a ward captain. I mean, I went home to Philadelphia because my cousin was thinking about running for mayor at the same time against a high school buddy, not, not against a high school buddy, following uh, a high school buddy, uh, uh, Michael, Michael Nutter, who was a, a knucklehead, but we're not gonna go there. But, but, but they, in Philadelphia, <laughs> they, they were giving out gift cards, which they've always done, right. to get people on the bus, to get them to post. There were people that were turning down $25 and $50 gift cards that would have put gas in tanks. So, so, so part of me wants to agree with you, the other thing is, I'm cheating. I'm looking at data. Mm. And, 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 and I'm looking at a multiple regression that when you put in a lot of variables, she talked about Sanders. I put in the Russian interference. I put in, uh, I put in uh, a lot of the big um, salacious news things that happened, the, the, the Donald uh, Trump, t things that would have derailed any other candidate. What you are setting up is this, 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 um, this, this time and, and space fight that what is, who, what is, what is, who, what is the United States of America? Is it, was, 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 you know, again, like you, what happened? I never thought the country would ex elect an African American president before a white woman, but it, it happened. Um, and so I, part of me wants to agree with you, but when you just look at the data, just purely look at the data, um, it's hard for me to, 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 to ignore it, that you take, take, out, take out, flip a state or two, mm -hmm. take out the Russian interference, just take out a, a, even some, a couple of the smaller variables that accounted for a little bit of variation, you have a different outcome. Not that Hillary ran the best um, um, campaign as, as, as we know. So I, I want to come back, and can I come back to your office, buy you a cup of coffee, and you and me sit and, and talk about it? Because I said it in 2008. Um, I went to Marymount University, and I said it in December of 2008. We're going to find out what America is, is the real America. You have an African American president, and the backlash that we saw against that e election, the Tea Party, McConnell coming out before one public policy even being articulated, before the ink was drowned this, on the first executive order, saying you're going to be a one-term president. What, what is that about? And then, of course, um, that uh, we were still obviously in the throes of the of the of the recession, um, and then 12 happened. I, I really thought that 12 was going to be closer than than it than it was. But again, um, uh, we we saw what happened in 12. Um, I yes, I started out by saying 16 should not have happened. But I said what I think you missed was a slide, and this is just a just to put it back in context, was this slide, which was just the, the, the trend line show, showing how far up she was, leading right up almost 60 days before the election. We've never seen anybody that far ahead lose with 60 days to go. Can, they, I, say, can I say something right Yes. It's always bothered me if you make the algorithm analysis based upon sheer data. I understand. Yeah, I understand. Without, without inputting some on the ground kind of uh, I understand. kind of tell us because I understand. I understand. Well, Hillary Clinton certainly was in the lead at the end, but I think you do better analysis if you begin to do a state by state. Yes. Of course, of course. If you do a state by state, which would probably result in a different kind of outcome because naturally she won, right? Right. She won the popular vote. There's no doubt about it. Right. And, 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 and you're, right about, you're right about one thing, too, the fact that she ran a very poor campaign. Now, I'll tell you this. Uh, I, I know, because we have people on the ground in those states that she that got flipped, right? Right. It was a bad campaign. Hillary Clinton refused to go into those particular areas. After <laughs> these folks had said to her, come down here, bring the money. Sir, I agree. Because there was an assumption that folks were going to turn out automatically for her. That's correct. And, and see, what I'm saying is that one has to, I, I am not opposed to data, believe it or not, I use it all the time. But I want to have these algorithms, these students understand that you have to insert some other kind of factors. Of course, too, of course. In terms of dealing with it, because, of course. because 
the money was being begged for. I, of course. I know personally, money we begged for money. Of course. Send us the money so we can turn the folk out. Of course. Of course. Because otherwise, sometimes the narrative flips in a way that tends to blame for the Democrats' loss in 16 on African Americans, right? You didn't turn out in Detroit. Because, wait a minute now. <laughs> you didn't ask me to turn out in Detroit. And there were assumptions made about people's surprise. If you go back beyond, let's say, Obama, right, his first run, there's been a steady increase in black voting, right? Mm -hmm. There's a steady increase in black voting. Obama caps that in 2008, right? Black voting, Latino, the coalition is there. Mm -hmm. the, the New American Coalition is right there. Mm -hmm. And we look at that, and, and, and but, but, but once you ask, why did that happen? Why did it happen in 2008, 2012? Why did it happen then? And what happened, what, what, what variable was different, let's say between 16 and 12? in terms of why we why 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 country lost so bad. I mean she lost bad in the electoral college. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, mean, I, I, I just want I, I'm not disputing what you're saying. Yeah no, I know right support you. But I think the data sometimes misleads us. I, again I I I cannot time just wouldn't allow the to, to, to drill right. down as deep because I really want to spend more time talking about some of the outcomes of public policy. And but you are one thousand percent in everything you said. I would still, I would still like to counter though. I still like to okay. with debate and rebut to say, even if you go state by state, even if you go state by state, even if you go state by state, um, even if you, even if you surrender, even if you surrender Florida, even if you surrender Ohio, Hillary Clinton lost Strawberry Mansion. Strawberry Mansion has never been lost ever. And so, so there's a lot of things that explain it. Yeah. And, but 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 it is and if I'm Strawberry Mansion is where I'm from. They, it wasn't like they imported a bunch of white people to come in and vote. Black people did not vote. And I'm sorry. I'm not gonna mince words here. Black people did not vote. In in in, in, in certain areas. Now I'm not, again, I'm not placing blame. You say is it up to the candidate to get people out to vote? Or is it up to people's responsibility to come out and vote for their best interest? Um, I, we can have that debate all day long, but the facts are the facts. Double-digit decrease. The, the amount of people, the, the African-American turnout in, in the district that represents Strawberry Mansion, it's a, it's a major uh, neighborhood in North Philadelphia, was lower than 2004. I'm still studying that. I'm still studying that. I'm still studying that, as in, as in some other people. But your points are, and I, I just wish you got, got, got to come back. We talk back. We come back in the room. And we're in the debate. Yes, sir. I got to think my time's running. No, we have time. Good evening. Um, Barton Taylor, Dr. Olson. And keeping in line, we're talking about the election, and particularly the 2008-2016 election. Particularly the black election. Is there an analysis or an assumption that Many of the, I would say, observers or you know, scientists make this assumption that the majority of blacks were, I would say, satisfied with the Obama administration. Or did the 2016 electorate results reflect that there was actually a number of blacks that was unsatisfied mm -hmm. that they stayed home? And all they saw was similar policies that were going to happen under the Clinton administration. Let me let me do what any what any let me channel my college professor days and ask you guys what do you think? Because I was here, I was here to say I'm sticking to the facts. You can't put things like that into a I mean a multiple regression. You have three million variables. But I, I stayed away from as, uh, assigning any value to why. All I know again is I was on the ground in Philadelphia when people refused to take uh, a, a 25 and then we got we went back and got some more money to, to up it up to 50 and people still people that would usually we used to try to keep people from trying to get three and four and five of it people says I ain't got time so I can't tell you why um, but so what do you guys think the question is did people show up because they were satisfied with happening 08 and 12 or did were they just totally dissatisfied yes ma'am so, um, Your name again? Okay. Get it on camera. 
I'm Jamie Beasley. Um, I was actually listening to a podcast that was talking about the influence that the media had on Donald Trump's um, presidency. And it went all the way back to The Apprentice and the perception that the media played or um, created that Donald Trump was just this really successful business owner, but he also um, was, was very racist. Um, so I think people, I think the media shaped, uh, shaped that narrative. Um, and so particularly with, when I talk to people my age, and black people, they're like, well, I don't wanna vote for two people, so I'm just not gonna vote. Mm -hmm. So that was a conversation that people were having. And so followed up with celebrities also pushing the narrative that we don't need to vote. You have people like Nick Cannon that was that like Angela Rye that was talking about um, this like separation or black people um, shouldn't be a part of um, American politics, and then you have Nick Can or Nick Cannon saying that, but then you have Angela Rye coming back saying that we need to bear must be a part of it um, because we need to understand it. I think there was a lot of confusion, and so the confusion it was people that was just like I don't you know I don't want to vote, particularly people my age and a little bit older, I'm 25. Um, so I think that's what it what it is. Okay, that's one that's one person's view. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Your name is. Um, I think in the wake of everything that's happening with our culture, you have the kind of movement, the one kind of generation things happening, and you start to have people become more enlightened and see the political realm for what it is in American society is that it's not getting any better, it needs to be worse. So within the political system that we exist in, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, they are starting to see it's not really voting is not helping move the power of being to make the conditions for black people getting better. So you're starting to have like Vote for what? Vote for more poverty, more racism, more militarization. And yeah, that's the issue that people are starting to look at and say, what is making this better? Like what presidency or what political candidate has changed the conditions, such as a Martin Luther King or Andrew Davis or that. So we're starting to see that type of ideology come out and start to see that type of lens and looking at like what is the really benefit of black people voting in the political process in the United States in 2018, 2019, 2020, whatever year. Wow. Okay. Yes, sir. I'm curious. Let me ask a question. Wow. Did you engage any data that, while on the one hand, there's a suggestion that African American and other groups did not turn out to vote as a result of a number of factors? I think what Barton is getting at there are some factors that that's there. There's a reason why people don't vote. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, did you come across any data that speaks to the maybe explosion or, or increase in new white voters who were mobilized in a way that they hadn't been mobilized uh, 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 over a period of time, especially during the eight years of the Obama administration? Yeah, uh, good, good question. No, because I remember, I remember very well the narrative that said that, wow, there's a whole lot of people showing up to vote in these primaries who hadn't voted before. Right. Yeah. Um, so it seems to me that while there's a conversation about the low turnout among African Americans, yeah. for that to really have meaning, yeah. it has to be just supposed beside the explosion of new white voters who had been dis dis uh, right. disconnected. Right. But then your point reinforces his point because if you go state by state mm -hmm. and you go district by district, I think the, the 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 influx that we saw accounted for some of the margins of victory in districts that he probably was going to win anyway. I, but, but to answer your question directly, no. Um, but I would like to give you something anecdotal. Sure. Um, I have two, I'm the father of two sons. One's an Air Force officer, one's a Navy officer. They both voted for the first time, the first one, my oldest in eight, the second one in 12. And I asked them why they voted for Barack. They had never done any research. Now, they, you know, they have a father that they could have asked questions, but of course they didn't. And, and, um, there was there was something that either they got caught up in all of the excitement or there was something because I asked them and they never could articulate not to my satisfaction there wasn't any any uh, policies that he articulated that he would do there was uh, there was nothing um, they couldn't tell me anything that he had done as a senator or or or, or anything about him really specific even though I gave each one of them had um, I gave each one of them a, a copy of his book but they got caught up. And so when I, when I was still in line with them, again, this is just anecdotal. I looked in the line, I looked up the line and down the line and saw a lot of young people voting, 
And and I asked that question myself. What's this? And where's this energy um, coming coming from? So I don't. So to answer your question, I don't know, and I don't know the answer to the other the other side that fueled the twelve, the eight and twelve res elections. Yes, ma'am. Uh huh. You got a question? You gonna get a question? Ask a question? <laughs> yes, sir. yes, ma'am. That's a good question. That is an excellent question. And I have to concede, it's, it's not a question I ever thought about um, because um, whether or not he would have been, I don't know. Um, but can I give you what I think in my gut? I don't think so. I, I, I don't, now, you say a better candidate, that means do you think I would, do I believe Dr. Shelton Good thinks that he would have won? Uh, no, I don't think he would have won. I, I don't think he would have won. Um, I, and, and let me tell you why. Just so, again, I, I set up this whole, remember I set this whole thing up by saying, I, 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 I'm looking at this in hindsight. So when you ask me about to speculate, uh, I, it's, you, you're stretching me a little bit. But all I know is that the variables that contributed to Trump winning started all the way back on, no, on uh, November the 9th of 2008, mm -hmm. you, had, you had a Republican Party energized and wanted a one-term uh, Obama presidency. They, then they ran uh, Romney, which I, I think they probably still regret, but uh, especially coming after the fact that McCain ran in eight. There was a lot of energy, as you were saying, that I think was building up. And then of course you add that to some backlash and then you add that to some people, the fact that some people just weren't feeling Hillary, despite she was a woman, and you could have had a, a woman president, white, uneducated women, meaning those with, um, uh, that don't have a high school diploma, less than 12 years of education. And then you put in the, the hacking of the DNC, you put in the Russian interference, you put in, you put in all those variables. No, I, I, I don't think the outcome would have been any different, but I, don't have any evidence or anything to back up my, my, my gut. I, I don't know um, if he if he would have won. I don't. Now, I, I have to go come back and answer a, a question that I'm, I need to be totally transparent. I did ask my son, and he did tell me um, at the end when I pressed him about why he voted for Barack, he told me because he was black. So, so I do, in the spirit of total transparency, if I had left that out, I would have been less than honest. And ultimately, when he pressed, both of my sons voted for a lot um, because he's black. Now, to answer the, the come back to your question about the speculation, uh, did you see the polls? The latest, there's three polls out just today. Um, Biden is at 39%. Bernie is now in third place behind Elizabeth Warren. If you ask me to give you some facts, so if I accept the polls, if I just accept them just on the numerical data and, and take it for what it's worth, if Bernie was so pumped, and maybe it's because of so many people in the field. He wouldn't have dropped so precipitously with Biden just entering the field. You see what I'm saying? So I don't think there was enough, I, I don't know if there was enough there. But I'm just speculating. I'm like you, I mean, I'm, I'm this person that doesn't go to bed till three o'clock watching Rachel Maddow, the 11th hour, CNN. I'm just trying to get data, then do some research on the side in between trying to run a business. Uh, yes, ma'am, you got a question. <laughs> you get the last one. <laughs> So uh, two things. Number one, I discuss in my classes that perhaps um, the vast majority of um, eligible voters are uneducated on the issue. So it's the politicking that we get caught up in, the entertainment of politics, rather than the policy discussion. Because if we have a policy discussion, those people that get caught up in the politicking, they vote the opposite of the policies that are 
uh, beneficial for themselves, yet it's the politic and the entertainment that they get caught up in. Okay. And so perhaps that couldn't have been a variable here with um, with the particular voters, is I'm caught up in the, the hype of it all, rather than the policies are what are most detrimental to me and my community. Um, the other point is, um, I cannot let that comment go by about black people in voting, because from the standpoint of, um, from a population standpoint, as um, the for, for overall in the United States for the United um, for uh, Black people, and then the inconsistency of voting, um, it's difficult for us to have and to maintain. Uh, black women can maintain a large um, input um, and pressure in terms of politics. Yet, as a voting bloc overall, black people do not because black people are inconsistent with the voting period. And if we had consistency with voting and just um, inserting ourselves in day-to-day -day local politics, then perhaps you can see some change. Yet, with the inconsistency, and which went to show to, with um, Stacey Abrams' campaign and how black men voted at 44%, black women voted at 54%. Their numbers can be there to make change, yet when you don't, you kind of get what you get. Of course, right. I, I can't right. argue that. I can't, I can't argue that. Again, I'm not assigning any value to, um, to behavior. I'm just saying um, behavior has consequences. Right. Mm -hmm. Behavior is it's, it's ones and zeros. Behavior has consequences when you add, like I said, when you put all the variables together, all of them. Again, stepwise multiple regression figures out how much when you add in, when you when you add in the variable, when you take out the the, the, the low voter turnout. And again, I'm not talking, you know, historic. I'm just talking, the, as you said, the inconsistency. I'm not talking about 08 numbers. I'm talking 04 numbers, mm -hmm. numbers that in some states were below 04 numbers. When you take that variable out, you can see, or you put that variable in, you see how much of the variation. And then you run, as you know, a confidence factor against it, and you come out with, you know, even at the .01, it, it comes out statistically significant. It is what it is. Right. I think people get mad at me. I say, don't, 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 you know, don't hope, go vote. Mm -hmm. <laughs> don't get mad, go vote. That's all, that's all I've ever said. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, that, uh, but, Again, I didn't even get a chance to talk about the public policies. We now, you know, everybody was so upset about the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court selections and, and results. He what do you expect? Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. And so, I, so I talked about the uh, obviously we talked about the presidential election, but again, I was I was glad that we won the House back. And again, like I said, I'm not sh not here to, to push right or left. I'm just saying. Although I, I'm not I'm not going to be disingenuous and not tell you where I'm coming, what side I'm I'm voting for. But um, consequence, uh, vote behavior has consequences. You, we, we saw what happened with the House, and then you saw what happened with the Senate. Um, in some respects, I wish we had gotten uh, the Senate more so than the House because of the public policy that comes as a result from it. Okay? And now that you got your question, we're good? Okay. <laughs> One more. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, what would be the future uh, implications, and the future election implications, the uh, division within the Democratic Party in supporting Ilhan Omar? I'm not mm. saying what she said is right or wrong, but what would be the implication of the next election? That's a good question. <laughs> Man, that's a good question. Um, I haven't, I haven't thought about. Okay. Let me, let, me, let me answer your question this way, because I haven't thought about it the way you asked it. Um, we've got a tremendous opportunity, right? If, if, you're, if you happen to vote that way. There's a tremendous opportunity. You've got a lot of energy on the, on the left. Um, you've got some, um, some extremely qualified candidates. Um, I'm not going to judge by the final outcome. Uh, you know, so let's say that um, the president wins again. I'm not going to. I'm not going to then turn around and start, you know, lambasting or criticizing the fact that we have so many candidates or whatever. I, I'm. I'm really going to just look at the, the quality of uh, of the issues, whether how the issues are articulated, and whether or not people have learned 
from 2016 and apply those lessons to 2 to 20. If, if we can continue to uh, learn. And then if somebody, some, think somebody asks me, do you take a, a super progressive stance? Do you take an anti-Trump stance? And my, my reply was, you gotta run one race at a time. But I get to me what the, the implications would be if, if what, if uh, a candidate emerged and lost to the Republican, to the Democratic Party? I don't know. I, I think you, everybody, I hope everybody's been following this um, indivisible pledge. Mm -hmm. Okay? And you saw that uh, at least half the candidates I'm um, signed that. It's going to be interesting to see if they stick to that. Mm -hmm. You know, and number, that number one pledge from the candidate side, which is the day a, 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 a winner is selected out of the primary, I will endorse immediately. Can, call, can I give you my card? And did you call me or email me? And let's see what happens the day after the Democratic primary, mm -hmm. regardless of who wins. Um, let's see what happens. Let's see, let's see what happens. I think we saw what happened in 16. And again, I didn't even make that a variable about the Sanders folks not coming over or whatever. I didn't put that variable in the, in the model. Um, but let's see what happens. Hopefully we're gonna, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Um, thank you. Dr. Greer told me y'all were gonna tell. She was telling me y'all gonna be up. Thank you.